talked about uh, sonship, um, where we were talking about restoring the father's heart. I'm going to be very quick just to round up a time of celebration we've had. Um, God says in, in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 to 6, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he will, uh, he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, uh, lest I come and strike the earth uh, with a curse. This is removing. We said that God wants to remove the heart uh, of an orphan. Uh, we, we have gone on for too long with hearts of orphans in our hearts, saved by grace, uh, moving in the, uh, in the things of God. We said you could even be giving, you could even be participating, you could even be an elder, you could even be a pastor like me, but you still have an orphan heart. So all of us are susceptible, are vulnerable to that because of the fall of man. We lost that in the Garden of Eden. But Christ has restored the Father's heart. Um, one of the things that show that you have now caught on to the Father's heart is discipline. God relates to us, not on casual terms as servants uh, or as just as mere friends, but as children, beloved children. All of creation is about Father God longing for a personal and intimate relationship uh, with his sons and daughters. One uh, part that is very clear in that sort of relationship or father-child relationship is discipline. Well, Father God's discipline is in fact evidence that we are his sons and daughters. Absence of discipline means absence of relationship. If I see you doing something and I up something wrong and I absolutely didn't care, that's an absence of a relation, even if I call you my friend. If we're so close and I actually see that you're doing something wrong, there is an orphan spirit that is there if I don't bring in some correction, admonition, and say, look, I don't think that is right. That means I'm operating in an orphan spirit zone. There is no relationship. There is no connection. We might actually, you know, there are friends that you say, these are friends, whenever I want to have fun, I have these friends. Those are orphan friends. There is no father's heart. There is no sonship in those sort of relationships. The kind of relationships that you must have is that when times are good, they are there with you. But when times are bad, they are also there with you. When you do right, they, uh, uh, they encourage you, they celebrate you. When you do wrong, they come in a nice way, put their arms around you and embrace you and say, the thing that you're doing I think is wrong. In my view, it's wrong. That is a sonship relationship. But if you then always get the good things from people, and when the bad things are being said, you just say, look, I don't know, no, 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 I don't like that. The, the naysayers, the, what do you call them? The, um, there is always these cliches in the social media. Uh, uh, the haters, the haters will always hate. Now, I'm not talking about crowds in social media. Those are crowds. Those are crowds. There's no relationship whatsoever there. But if people that are close to you, you see them as haters because they have said something that you just didn't like, then you are operating in an orphan heart zone. You are an orphan. Now, discipline means you are able to take the Father's correction. How does God the Father correct us? Big voice from heaven. Hear forth, my son, my daughter, you have done something terribly wrong. Hear from me and me alone. And that's when you're fast asleep and God speaks and that voice just speaks so loud and fills up the room. You get up and then God says, yes, get up right now. Yes, that deal you want to do, you know it's wrong. 
Um, now stand forth. And then he said, and then you got to, I was just talking to God in the morning and God spoke to me. Let me tell you, friends, God is going to use your brother, your sister, your workmate, the person that is close to you, your husband, your wife, your daughter, your son, your father, your mother, to say some admonition about what you're about to do. I know Pentecostals, charismatics like ourselves, we always want to just almost say God and me alone and distance everybody. But when it's celebration time, why can't you just have it with God alone? <laughs> you and God, Murtu. Wapasa, go and have your own uh, 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 whatever, graduation party at home. Why do you invite us? So discipline means your ability to retain sonship and have a father's heart and take admonition and correction. How many of us react badly when you're corrected by the person who you respect and love? How many of us take correction from our wives and our husbands easily? Oh, then there's a fire. You always want to correct me. And I, I think you don't understand me. And, 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 and I know that you never have understood me. I know we've been married for a long time. This aspect, you'd never understand me. Yeah, in fact, the only person who understands me is my mother. Then for sure. Then the whole thing <laughs> becomes a, a, a fire. And you pour uh, fuel on the fire. Now mother is into the whole situation. Just because you just don't want to be corrected to put your socks in the uh, uh, washing basket. Just that. You don't want to be corrected to just do the dishes. You, you don't want that. Just to pick up some things in the house. Now you bring in your whole, your whole mother into the whole equation. Why do you do it? It's because you're operating in an orphan heart and you have not received the father's heart that takes every big and small correction as discipline from the father because he only disciplines those he loves. God the father disciplines us through the relationships and the environment that we find ourselves in. Don't try and make this too super spiritual for nothing. Let me tell you, when a brother, a friend, a colleague comes and says, I don't think that you should be doing that. Please stop and listen sometimes. They don't mean to harm you if they're close to you. All they mean is that I see it differently than you. Stop, think, evaluate, and respond and say, I think, I think I'm going to think about it. I'm going to think of How many of us stop to think about it? How many of us react badly when a friend comes in and says, look, I, I, I think, I know that this, uh, you like this, um, this car, <laughs> but I don't think you should be buying this car. Oh, Jiras. <laughs> uh, you know? You know, the people that don't like good things for other people. No. He's just saying prioritize his fees haven't been paid. And there you are trying to buy another car. Come on. Think about it. That's the discipline of the father. Prioritize. Have your values aligned to what you're trying to do. That's all they are saying. They're not jealous about you, you and your car. No. Allow that sort of process to play out. So absence of discipline means absence of relationship. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 7 to 8. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Uh, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So if you rebuff chastening, you are an illegitimate son you will not benefit from the Father's heart. If someone is trying to bring truth or admonition to your life and you resist it, then you are like all illegitimate children and not as sons and daughters, at least in, uh, in heart attitude. Inability to receive discipline can be a sign of an orphan heart. Orphan hearts have an independent spirit, resist admonition, correction, chastening. They react badly. When they're being disciplined, they, they react so bad. They suck, they feel rejection and all sorts of things just because you're just about to discipline them. 
or they're going through discipline. Some of us, our situations are a way of God disciplining us. Things are tough for you, but guess what? It could be God. I'm not saying all the time. It could be God just bringing discipline to you. So that God just wants you, your mind, your whole attitude, your spirituality, to respond to the Father's heart. And it takes some of the situations that you go through. Your attitude towards authority can reveal whether you have a father's heart or not. There are some of us who react badly to authority. We just don't want. You just don't respect your boss at work because you think, oh, no, I don't, I don't do this sort of thing. Because I'm actually, I've got a master's, they've got a diploma. No, so, so what? <laughs> it is about honoring Authority, and that is a, father, a father's heart. It has nothing to do with qualifications. Some of us have problems honoring the people that are around you, relatives and so on and so forth. Those in positions of authority or seniority, there are people who have problems in honoring senior people around them. There's so many senior people around me here in this church, people who are older than me. You're my brothers and my sisters, but... Don't ever mistake that I dishonor the fact that you're older than me and in my view, you are my bigger brother, my bigger sister, even though I'm your pastor. I know that elsewhere, even old men will be talking, no, he's our, he's our father. I know that that could be reference, but you know what? When you honor those who are older, and the Bible is very clear about honoring the older amongst you, he says, treat them as sisters and brothers and, and, and so on and so forth. So we need, we need to have that. If you don't have that, you have an orphan's heart. You are running away from discipline because people who don't own authority and let me even put seniority have a problem with discipline and they are coming from an orphan heart reaction. What is your view of authority? Not because authority is doing a good job. They might actually be messing it up. Doesn't matter whether it's public authority or in homes or in schools or in job situations. We have to carry the heart of a son and the heart of the father. Obedience comes through suffering. You always have a choice to obey or to sacrifice. Sons obey and not sacrifice. They obey. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8 to 10. Though he was a son, he learned obedience, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Though he was a son, let me even substitute that. Though he was God, the son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. To obey is always better than sacrifice. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 22 to 23, so Samuel said, has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams, for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as an iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. Obedience is a sign of sonship. Let me tell you, when you are maturing and growing as a believer, the, the, the gauge you must always use is not how often you speak in tongues because you can go to 1 Corinthians 13 there. It would tell you what, what Paul thinks about all that. The gauge you must use is not the attendance of meetings that are around you. The gauge you must use is not the amount of people that you're talking to or who you have an audience with. The gauge you must use is the level of obedience. 
in all aspects of your walk with God. That's sonship. So you go through the word and say, where does God ask me to obey and not to question or rationalize? It doesn't matter which area of your life. So you, you, you take every area of your life and say, what is, the, um, what is the gauge? What is the percentage? What is the rate of my obedience in there? That shows your rate of maturity. That shows your level of maturity. And not about crowds. It's not even about appointment into positions. Because we've got a lot of immature people in high authority. But the gauge is about obedience. Are you obeying the word of the Lord? And to what rate are you obeying that word of God? Or you are rationalizing it and making it, well, I can only do this part, but that part God must understand. Now, you are trying to make a sacrifice and God is saying obey. He says to obey is better than sacrifice. Now, let me just tell you some of the things I've had to, I've had to do some crazy things in my life. And recently, I won't tell you which ones. Recently, I've had to do some crazy things because God said. Sometimes very much against my own grain and thinking. I said, look, I shouldn't be doing this. And I don't want to do this. But you find yourself doing that thing because the voice of God said so. And you just have to do. And you will look stupid sometimes. You will look uneducated. You will look maybe even irrelevant. You will look maybe even unpopular sometimes. But to obey is better than sacrifice. I'd rather obey God than man. And that is a sign, sign that you have got the Father's heart. Now for, for, um, for Saul, he was busy impressing and pleasing everybody else. And he says, well, I needed to do the sacrifice. So eventually when you don't obey, it means at some point in your life, you're going to make a sacrifice. And God says to obey is better than sacrifice because it it. It's not what he intended in the first place. That's not what he wanted from you. He didn't want you to come and impress him with sacrifices. God, I will do all these things now, now that I've known that I messed up. No, you should have obeyed in the first place as a son. Sacrifice always brings about some level of self-righteousness. Did you know that? When you sacrifice, you're now kind of redeeming yourself. Ah, that's what she gonna at least um, <laughs> Sometimes when you have, um, when you're a parent, remember our daughter when she was a lot younger, five, six years old. Sometimes we, will, we had varying levels of discipline. But one of the discipline was Literally, to just leave her alone. She didn't like that. And then she would say, why don't you just spank me so that this issue is dealt with? Why? It's because there is a sense that you have paid back and you have won back your righteousness. So if you do something wrong and nobody, and that person you've done that wrong actually does nothing, you feel like you are still carrying a weight. Have you ever felt like you feel like the monkey is still on your back? Can't you do something? Be angry. Do something that is... Shout at me. Scream at me so that I feel good. We counsel with people. So, particularly with couples. One of the spouses does something wrong. And then you can actually hear, I... I, 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 I was relieved when she was angry with me. I was relieved. Because what? It was the sacrifice that now he was making. In the first instance, he should have obeyed. But David was a son after God's own heart, isn't it? That whenever he messed up, where did he run to? He didn't run to a sacrifice. He ran to the Father. All the time. He ran to the Father. He ran to God all the time. So 
When you do mess it up, you don't start trying to manufacture a situation that changes. No, you repent and go to God. That is the discipline that comes through being a son and also understanding the father's heart. How about taking an inheritance? So when you go through discipline, um, you, you learn obedience ahead of sacrifice. Sometimes you'll have to do some sacrifice because that's what it is. But the initial port of call is that you go through obedience. But in all this, the Father is preparing you. So that suffering, that pain you're going through, that discipline, the Father is preparing you for an inheritance. We are unable to receive because we don't have the capacity to receive. We don't have the ability to receive. We don't have the strength to receive because we are not prepared to receive. We have not gone through discipline. We have not gone through obedience so that when God pours out things in our own lap, we are able to sustain that blessing. There's a lot of teaching in some quarters of the church today about claiming or taking your inheritance, that your inheritance from God is is your right in Christ and you just need to reach out and take hold of it. There is that sort of kind of click your finger, get it, let's do it. No, let me just tell you, God doesn't work like that. God works with the capacity that you have. That means that God is like all of us. Who gives a five-year-old the car keys to drive out of the car park? Who does that? If you don't do it, so then you think God is going to do that. No. So we have to be capacitated to receive from God. So even though your inheritance is there, it is not there to access in the current condition. You've got to go through a process. Because you're a son, you've got to go through discipline. You've got to go through some suffering. Though he was a son, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. And then you've got to go through that sort of naturing. And then capacity is built. You are being prepared to take the father's inheritance. Taking your inheritance and receiving it are two different things that can produce two very different results. You can take your inheritance, but you can also receive your inheritance. Now, you know the difference already. You know the difference. An inheritance taken by an orphan's heart will, uh, with orphan thinking is a danger of blowing your mind off. You, are, you will blow yourself. You will spoil yourself. You will damage yourself. If we have not embraced healthy, accountable relationships, the anointing can quickly empower us and take us places where our character may not be able to keep our boat afloat. Now, a simple thing here. We can take our inheritance because of the gifting, because of the anointing that we have. But if we have not gone through obedience and suffering and nurturing the Father's heart, that anointing and gifting will take us to a place where our character has not been developed to maintain that inheritance. So we destroy ourselves. The prodigal son and the son who stayed is an example of that. The former, which is the prodigal son, prematurely took his inheritance and the latter did not receive his inheritance. Both did not have the character to receive. Now, let me just show you something in this portion of Scripture. Did you know that the father gave the inheritance to both of them all at the same time? Did you know that? You didn't know that. So both were given. It's just that the other son stayed. So his inheritance stayed with him at home. Here's what scripture says. Luke 15, verse 11 to 12. Then he said, a certain man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. Is that what scripture says? So if both of them got the inheritance, one took, the other one did not receive. 
So the one took and left. The other one was given but did not receive. So it remained with the father. But it was his already because he gave to both. He says, look, these are your cows. These are, these are his cows. These are your donkeys. These are his donkeys. And so on and so forth. But one did not receive. And therein lies the father's heart and sonship approach. Both of them had an orphan heart. Both of them at that time, they behaved like orphans. Both. The one who was given and stayed at home did not receive. Because his reaction when the one who was prodigal and left was that, I've always been here and you never killed a goat for me. And he says, but, but all this is yours. How come you didn't receive? He didn't have the capacity, the character to even receive. The one who left didn't have the character and the capacity to even take, but he took it and he destroyed him. Both of them were, were orphans in the father's house. Both. Both were orphans in the father's house. The one did not learn to receive. The other one did not learn how to take. Once and often, or once and often, but now a son. And then the, the prodigal son goes away, comes back. says, but when he came to himself... He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. That was the moment he connected to the father's heart. Because his realization wasn't because of anything else. He says, I know how my father treats even servants. It's almost like our reaction to God must always, how often, how, how does God treat the unbeliever? Is he always holding a big stick and killing them? No, he's not. He's a loving God. So he's not even, the sinner, he's not even trying to kill them and slaughter them and put them to hell. He's trying to reach out to them. So the, father, the son, the prodigal son, Realize and recognize that I know the heart of the Father. He is not cruel. He is not brutal. He, I only want to go and bask in that Father's heart. I know even if I said I want to be your servant, he would treat me much better than the way I see myself in this situation. So he reaches out to the Father's heart before he sees the Father. So by the time he connects with the Father, their hearts are in the Father's heart. Um, and they're walking together. The father connected with the son and made his home in him. Let me just finish. Jacob had 12 sons. His eldest son was Reuben. And his second last born, according to the sons, is, um, is Joseph. You find in chapter 49 of Genesis where Jacob blesses his sons. He reveals his heart as a father to his sons. And when I was reading through there, I just said, can you imagine on that day God begins to reveal his heart to all of us? And that day will come where we'll all be judged. Not, we won't be judged. By the way, we won't be judged with sinners. We will be judged among saints, and God would reveal what we have done. But it's not because now, oh, by the way, I made a mistake, you go to hell. No, there is a, that day of, of reckoning. So can you imagine whilst he's seated there and begins to reveal what his heart and what was happening between him and I. And Jacob had that journey with his sons. He was quite intimate with his sons, by the way. So Reuben, being the eldest, he blesses Reuben. Hear this prayer about Reuben. In Genesis 49, verse 3 to 4, it says, Reuben, you are my firstborn. 
my might and the beginning of my strength. Now, you can connect with, uh, with Jacob right when he was still with his father-in-law and the environment that he was in and how he celebrated his first son. How, he, how Reuben made him feel like a man again because remember he had run away from his brother. Now he has a family. Now he has a son. And says the excellence of dignity and the excellence of power. Wakandita munu inin. Kupere kwa kwako kwa kita kutindi zika anwe. Kutindiru o munu anuko na kita muri. I can, be a, I can be a man again. The excellence of dignity. and Unstable as water. He turns now. You, Reuben, now. Unstable as water. You shall not excel. Now, it's an oxymoron. He just said dignity and excellence. And he says, unstable. But you, sh- you, 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 Reuben, will not excel. Because of what? Because you went up to your father's bed. Then you defiled it. He went up to my couch. He moves on to the next son. What's the father's heart for you like today? If the father came today and had this conversation... Here's what God is saying. Just you being there, you, you, you are a blessing to me. I love you, dear. But will he turn around and say, but you, you defiled the name of the Lord. You defiled my name. What is it? We've got to repent at some point to connect with the Father. But flip this. He goes to Joseph. Prior to this blessing, he calls Joseph into his, into his room and says, bring your sons, Ephraim and, and Manasseh. He blesses them. And he raises them to be as if these are also his sons. And that they will inherit from him at the same level as the other sons, the 12 sons of Jacob. This is the father's heart. And here's what he says to Joseph. Because Joseph got a double portion of his father's heart. It says in Genesis 49, 22 to 25, Joseph is a fruitful bough. A fruitful bough by a well. His branches run over the wall. The archers have bitterly grieved him, shot at him and hated him. But his bow remained strength, uh, remained in strength. And the arms of his hands were made strong by the hands of the mighty God of Jacob. From there is the shepherd, the stone of Israel. By the God of your father, who will help you, and by the almighty, who will bless you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breast and of the womb. That's Joseph. This is a the guy they nearly killed. This is the guy who should be limping. You know how people just limping and say, look, you, you don't have an idea of what, what my journey. You, you, don't, you don't know that my parents, uh, you know, don't know my brother sold me. You know, there are people who always walk with that, who are always thinking that the whole world owes them because of how they were brought up. Uh, 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 you know, you, you have no idea. Ask him, ask him, ask him. In 1976, what happened to me? I mean, wh- this is like 43 years ago. Wake up and smell the coffee and let's move on. No, you have no idea. 1989, it happened again. It was on a Sunday, the 15th of March. You even know the date. Joseph is not being referred to as the... The father says, I know there were archers who tried to get hold of him. I know that he's going through difficult times. But this boy is a fruitful vine. 
This boy is something else. And so Joseph, his response earlier on in chapter 45, he says, it was not you. It was God who sent me ahead of you for posterity's sake. Although you, you lot, you, 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 Ruben, you, Simeon, you, 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 the way you looked at me, I know that you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. That is the heart of a son responding to the father. How do you respond to the hardships that you've gone through? Do you continue to justify your sins like Reuben, thinking that, well, it's all going to be well. Let me just carry on. Jacob says, you will not excel. Or do you continue to carry on with, with this crutch of your upbringing that was not so right and that abuse that you've gone through? And Jacob says, you're a fruitful vine. You're going to be blessed. Can't you rise up and connect to the Father's heart what he says about your life? Let's stand. Let's stand. Hallelujah. Oh, shakaba sandalaba. Fruitful vine. Don't shun away discipline. Don't shun away correction in your life. It's good for you. Connect to the Father's heart. Are you Reuben? Are you Joseph? Which one are you? Are you David or are you Saul? Which one? Are you the f son who stayed or the son who left? Are you a taker or are you a receiver? Are you going to move with capacity creation and, ca and character formation or you're going to move with anointing and gifting? Which son are you? David and Saul. A man after God's own heart. Are you going to be the son who stayed or the son who left? The son who left says, I'll rise up and go back to my father. Oh, are you going to be Reuben? Or oh, Joseph? Where for Joseph was, he's a fruitful vine. Father, I want to thank you for this morning for what you're doing. We are moved by the testimonies that we heard earlier on but we also moved that we you want to give us your heart that we connect with the father's heart that we may be truly sons we are tired of being orphans we are tired of playing second fiddle we are we are tired of playing self pity we are tired of 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 making sacrifices where we should obey. Lord, we, we want to come and just obey you. We want to have a life of repentance, a lifestyle of repentance, where we walk in obedience with you, continuously focusing on you. Lord, we are tired of just waiting to either receive or to take inheritance. When we are connected to you, we know that all that you have is ours. Thank you for taking us to this place. Thank you for anointing us and making us believe again in what you have said in your word about us. We believe in your word today. Anoint us, make us whole. Yes, bring us to the place where we will know that the abundance of the Father is all ours. We just have to reach out to him. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing continuously. As we continue to celebrate your word last year when you said this time next year, Lord, we ask that you may fulfill your word to us. 
in Jesus' name. Amen.